Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, great video today. We're gonna react to Umar of the Orient with the title How Bosnia Became Muslim. This is of course a must watch for me coming from the Balkans, originally from Northern Macedonia. Of course, I want to know how Bosnia, another Slavic Balkan country, came to Islam. I already know a few things about Bosnia, such as that they weren't under the Orthodox Christian Church. However, they were following a Christian sect called the Bogomils. And the Bogomils were not Trinitarian, nor did they believe that Jesus was God. Therefore, the entry into Islam must have been much easier for the Bosnians than for the other Orthodox Christians of the Balkan. All right, guys, but before we start the video, as always, if you enjoy my work, leave me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box below to further support. And now, with no further ado, let's have a look. Did you know that the Bosnians used to pray five times a day before they were even Muslim? You see, in the 200s, the Roman that, Empire no. had gotten too large and was now buckling under its own weight. And in 285, in a move that would forever seal the fate of the Roman Empire, the decision was made to split the administration of the empire between two cities, keeping the capital of the western half in Rome and bringing the eastern half under the administrative control of Constantinople. And a few yes, decades later, a second fateful Greeks. decision would be made when in 313, the Roman Empire officially ended its persecution of the Christians and officially recognized the religion now that the first Christian emperor had ascended to the throne. Yes, and this is extremely important for Christians nowadays, especially the so-called conservative, neo-nationalistic type of Christian nowadays, to realize that the Roman Empire was spreading and was at its peak when there were pagans. When the Roman Empire officially became Christian, of course, they still conquered. However, the growth that the Roman Empire experienced prior to Christianity was already tremendous. I would even say that it was greater than what followed after they adopted Christianity. Christians of all doctrines, some Unitarian, some Binitarian, and some Trinitarian began to live in the Roman Empire without any constant fear of oppression and they continued building churches and spreading their religion throughout the empire. Yes, and this is extremely important for Christians to understand yet again, because all of those different beliefs existed simultaneously in the Roman Empire. There was not one Christianity that was everywhere in the Roman Empire. Quite the opposite, they had differing beliefs. As he just said, some were Trinitarians, some were not. Just when the church fathers came to power ultimately and established the Nicene Creed, this is when the persecution really started and those other beliefs were called heretical. Eventually, this led to great conflicts and confusion between the churches. And so, in 380, the Roman Empire officially adopted a Trinitarian version of Christianity yes, as its official religion and began a campaign of persecution against all and other And this is already almost 400 years after Christ. And that's where things get interesting. You see, these edicts were easy to enforce in the major cities where the administrative authority was strong. But the further you went out from the cities, the weaker the empire's grip was on its population. And even within the major cities themselves, Rome and Byzantine were far enough apart from each other that the churches in each city began to differ. And eventually by 1054, the Catholic Church in Rome and the Eastern Orthodox Church in Constantinople had completely split from each other. Yeah, so now Umar fast forwarded to the Great Schism. The Great Schism predominantly, not exclusively, was about the papacy, not about the Trinity. The Trinity issue was already settled at the Council of Nicaea, essentially, and therefore the Catholics and the Orthodox agreed on that. However, what was mentioned previously here by Umar is absolutely crucial that the Trinitarian doctrine has been enforced onto the people and that it was enforced within the cities, first and foremost, of course, and the further you go out of those cities, the less control the state had. And there again, you realize this was a state-enforced religion, not a naturally held belief, nor was it something that the people traditionally practiced. And this is really what it boils down to. The question is, what was the message of Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, and what kind of message did he leave for his apostles and the people to come? But as you can clearly see, that message was long gone. It was lost. And therefore, you need all of those church fathers, those authorities to come up with some sort of unity. And therefore, they chose the Trinity. What was known as the Great Schism. And then you had the lands of Bosnia. 
Bosnia sits right along the border between the dominions of the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox exactly. churches. Exactly. Just outside of the reach of both of them. Yeah, for somebody coming from the Balkan, I can attest to that. We had friends in Croatia, for example, and the Croatians, they were Roman Catholic. However, then you get to Serbia, the Serbians are Orthodox Christians, and the same applies to the Northern Macedonians, to the Bulgarians, and to the Greeks. And because of this, persecuted sects of Christianity were able to escape punishment and sometimes even flourish there. One of the most famous examples of this was the Church of Bogomil in the 900s. Yes, a Bulgarian the priest who condemned the use of the cross, declaring it a form of idol worship. Under his leadership, True. the Bogomils refused to bow down before any images or relics or saints. And they were even said to have prayed five times a day, reciting the Lord's Prayer each time. They also refused to accept Jesus, peace be upon him, as the second person in a trinity, but rather that he was the spoken word of God. A concept that Islam affirms because Allah simply said the word be and he was created. Just like Adam, not needing a father. Bogomilism eventually spread throughout Bosnia and the surrounding areas even though they were considered heretics by both the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. Bogomilism and other heretical sects eventually led to Pope Gregory IX calling for a crusade against Bosnia in 1235. This then led to the Bosnian Crusades in which Hungary tried but failed to invade Bosnia, only managing to capture some peripheral territories where they burned the so-called Bosnian heretics at the stake. The only reason the invasion stopped was because the Mongols began invading Europe from the east and the Hungarian army was recalled to defend it. Other popes later on continued to call for the Crusades against the Bosnians, such as Pope Innocent IV, Pope Benedict XII, and Pope Urban V. All of their hostility and animosity from both the popes in Rome and the archbishops in Constantinople and the fact that the Bosnians themselves were split between many churches and their competing doctrines and ideas meant that there was no dominant church in Bosnia yeah, and that the Bosnians day, as a whole were less Bosnia devoted well, to Christianity than other peoples in the Roman Empire. And then in the late 1300s, a new religion appeared on its borders. The Ottoman Empire had begun their expansion into the Balkans, conquering much of modern-day Greece and Macedonia and Serbia before launching a campaign against Bosnia. Exactly. And for my viewers here, this is the history that I've been told over and over again growing up. Essentially, the Ottomans, the Turks, the Muslims conquered our lands. They took over and they were ruling over us for 500 years. And therefore, Islam on the Balkan was always seen as the enemy. Eventually, in 1463, the Ottoman Empire officially established the Sanjak of Bosnia. But it would take another 129 years before all of modern-day Bosnia was finally incorporated into the Muslim Empire. At that time in history, religion was highly intertwined with identity and citizenship. Yes, it was exactly. a declaration of your allegiance. And yes. just like in modern... And this is why we had the saying in Macedonia on the Balkan that somebody that accepts Islam, there was not such a thing, nobody knew about accepting Islam. They simply would say he became a Turk. And this is how it was measured, truly. Back in the day when the Ottomans were mapping that area, they were categorizing with faith, essentially. Those are Muslim, those are Christians, etc., etc., you name it. So therefore, the religious identity became your cultural, your nationalistic identity as well. And this is very strong to this very day on the Balkan. This is why I'm still in such a great conflict with my family, because they cannot understand that somebody accepted a faith. They truly believe that I changed my nationality. Times, if you're not a citizen of a country, you won't have access to the full rights of it. You can't vote if you're not a citizen. You can't hold office if you're not a citizen. And in some countries even, you can't buy property if you're not a citizen. Well, in medieval yeah, sure. Europe, the church and the state were one and the same. And if you wanted full rights of citizenship, you needed to belong to the state church. Similarly, under the Ottoman rule, the Ottoman government was intertwined with the rulings and practices of Islam. And so to hold office or to be in some high-ranking positions in the army, one had to swear their allegiance to Islam. Yes. However, the difference between the European states and the Ottoman Empire was that while Christians burned Bosnians at the stake for being part of the wrong church, the Ottomans, by comparison, were exceptionally tolerant of other religions, allowing them to continue practicing their beliefs and their faith, and even appointing for them judges within their own communities to rule according to their local laws separate from the Islamic legal system. 
Yes, absolutely. And this is the projection within the Christian lands, within the Western world, if you will. They're so afraid of an Islamic caliphate, right? They're so afraid. What will happen? Oh, everybody has to become Muslim. But that was never the case historically whatsoever. However, and this is why I say it is a projection, of course, within the Christian lands, yes, you had expulsions, for example, in Spain, where all the Muslims were kicked out. And many more examples as such, ultimately leading to the conclusion that if you're not a Christian within Christian lands, you're going to get kicked out. And this is what they then project onto Islam. But this is not the case whatsoever. And the Balkan is a testament to that as well. Because all the Christian Orthodox churches stayed functioning to this very day. We still have thousands of churches still intact on the Balkans. Actually, if you rewind a little bit and you look into communism, when communism spread over the Balkans, this is what truly destroyed Christianity and Islam during that time frame. However, under Islamic rule, all the Christians, all the Jews kept on practicing. And as for the jizya tax non-Muslims had to pay, this was in place as part of a system whereby Muslim armies would protect the lands and its inhabitants, even if the locals weren't Muslim and those locals wouldn't be conscripted and forced to take up arms. Yeah, and considering Bosnia was the frontier land. And moreover, if you look into the percentage of the Jizya tax and you compare that to nowadays in age, Texas, yeah, well, I know what I would be choosing. And under the constant pressure from the Austrian and Hungarian armies, and that it had experienced its own crusades from the Catholic churches in the past, the Ottomans had to expend enormous resources to fortify those borders from future invasions. And of course, if someone converted to Islam, that jizya tax no longer applied. It was these incentives along with the fact that the Bosnians weren't particularly loyal to any church, as well as the fact that many of them were already familiar with many of the elements of Islam because of the influence of Bogomilism in their past, that all of this eventually caused many Bosnians to embrace Islam. Over a hundred years, a gradual change took place as individuals and families and tribes converted to Islam one by one, each choosing one reason to convert or another. All right, guys, and this is it for today's video. Absolutely well done. Yet again, great job, Umar of the Orient. If you haven't subscribed to his channel, please head over there now. Follow him, leave a like, and let him know that Bobby sent you. That being said, Bosnia has been a fascination of mine since I reverted to Islam. Believe it or not, my ignorance was humongous when I was still a teenager or even in my early 20s. I simply didn't understand that there were Slavs on the Balkan that were Muslim. I thought that only Albanians and Turks were Muslim on the Balkan. Later on, I found out that actually even ethnic, quote-unquote, Macedonians, Bulgarians, that are Muslim as well. But when it comes down to Bosnia, back then I didn't do any research. And now thinking about it, that there is a Slavic Balkan country that is Muslim, this is absolutely amazing to me, of course. And it is, inshallah, a future travel destination of mine for sure. Because when I look at the Bosnian people, honestly, when I look at the Bosnian people, even the Serbian people, Croatian people, etc., I see us all as one people. Because if Germany can be a country, if France can be a country, if Spain can be a country, man, if Russia can be a country, then I believe that the Balkans can be a country as well. But in this day and age, we are in this time of nationalism still, and people pride themselves in their small little nations, which I find absolutely ridiculous. Of course, if you look at Northern Macedonia, for example, it has roughly 2 million people and it leads to nothing but instability economically, religiously, socially, etc, etc. So therefore, obviously, if those countries would unite, they would be, of course, stronger. However, the pan-Slavic project has already failed under Yugoslavia. And that is a can of worms that I don't want to open up in today's video. Anyways, guys, if you liked it, leave a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check out the links in the description box to further support my work. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace. <laughs>